important uh, in numbers to do that. So uh, as I said, I'm a civil servant. Uh, I work for the government and that means that when I give talks like this, I have to kind of balance what I'm saying between giving my own personal opinion and representing government policy. I think I'll start by saying in, in the presence of the Climate Action Network uh, activists uh, that I proudly call myself a climate activist. I've been working in this field for 12 years now. Uh, I try to cut my own carbon emissions. I annoy my family and friends by challenging them about their own behaviour. Um, I write to my MP quite regularly and tell her that this is, uh, for me, the most important issue that I vote on. So, um, so as well as being a civil servant, I, I'm pretty passionate about climate change. And I think that's not unusual inside the administration. Um, I, as I said, I work for the Department for Business, Energy, Industrial Strategy, BAYS. Uh, I think we've got about 600 people who work on climate change uh, pretty much full time, um, whether that is international negotiations, um, setting up renewable energy, decarbonising industry like I do, um, trying to make homes greener, setting up heat networks. There's a lot of jobs, um, lots of really smart people, um, quite a few with PhDs in climate science. That doesn't include me, but uh, people who've really worked in this area for a long time and care very much about it. So uh, that, that's kind of my, um, my pitch, that it's possible both to be an activist and a bureaucrat. Um, and let me see if I can do my first bit of screen sharing. Uh, hopefully this works. So this is just my lighthearted way of illustrating um, the fact that Bayes is really pretty full of climate activists because the first day I got there, I opened the fridge and discovered that most of my colleagues like me were trying to go vegan uh, or go plant-based. Uh, in order to cut their carbon emissions. So uh, we get to work on lots of big policy issues and big spending programmes, uh, but we also try to, um, we think about our own individual impacts as well. So we care about climate change and so do the ministers who have committed this country to getting to net zero within a generation. And one of the interesting things about working inside the civil service is that you also get to see the the balancing act the difficult decisions that ministers have to make this year especially we've got really tight public spending um everybody knows the economic situation uh for for no fault of this government but just the public health situation <coughs> is really pretty dire um and it's it's fascinating to watch ministers think how do we explain to the public and how do we explain to businesses why they should make this big transformation to low carbon or carbon neutrality. Um, it's going to be disruptive, but there will be benefits as well. And seeing how they think about how to pitch that politically is really interesting. So um, tonight I will try not to greenwash my talk. Um, I know, and, and we all know, ministers know, that the UK is not yet doing enough to reach net zero. Um, and, and there's basically no country in the world that is yet doing that. Um, but I do hope that in talking about COVID and climate change and how they're interrelated this year, I can leave you at the end of my talk a little bit optimistic about public policy trends um, and how investors are making decisions this year, even in, a, in the year of COVID. So let me tell you a bit about what it's been like inside government uh, and then I'll tell you about what we hear from businesses about their investment decisions. So this has been a really incredible year. Um, I have never seen anything like it. I've worked in the civil service for 15 years now um, and civil servants and ministers have had to set up huge public health schemes, um, economic support schemes, faster than we ever imagined was possible. Um, and politicians have had to take decisions at lightning speed. And obviously they've made some mistakes um, and those are well publicised, uh, but it's really been a very unusual environment to work in. Um, and to give you some sense of the scale of that, in April, uh, when, um, you know, when we'd all kind of gone into lockdown the first time and we realised what a huge issue COVID-19 was, about a quarter of my department got mobilised to work on COVID. Uh, that's about a thousand people just stopped doing their normal jobs and went and did something that they'd, they probably hadn't even heard of a month before. Um, which was helping the economy to respond to COVID. And inevitably that did slow some of our existing work. Um, so the policies and some of the funding programmes on climate change that we were all working on, some of those got delayed by weeks and some of them got delayed by months. Um, and that was a 
reality. But at the same time, uh, immediately that all of that started, he had hundreds of people thinking, how do we pitch a green recovery to the Treasury and to the government? And um, I'm old enough to remember the last financial crisis. Uh, I was working in Whitehall when the banking crisis hit uh, in 2008. And um, we did not have notable success in calling for a green recovery at that point. Um, and some of you may remember uh, the headlines that we had then. Uh, let's see if this is working. Um, so get rid of the green crap. That was um, a, a, a phrase that was attributed uh, to George Osborne. I don't know whether it was true, but there was certainly that sense from the Treasury that um, they saw climate action as necessary. You know, they accepted the science um, behind climate change. They were signed up to the Climate Change Act as a government. But when it came down to it, when they were thinking about economic recovery from the last crisis, they saw climate action as something that could wait a bit um, because, it, because it was a cost, because it was a burden. So this year, uh, looking back to March or April, when we, um, we realised what a huge economic crisis this was, this time we had a very different response. Um, and hundreds of people inside Whitehall started thinking very fast about how can we give ministers evidence about how, if they're going to spend a lot of money on fiscal stimulus, how can they do that in a way that helps their climate goals and helps to achieve net zero? And we drew obviously on work by universities, um, by uh, reports on, by think tanks, NGOs, business associations and so forth. Um, and we gave much better numbers to ministers, um, which helped to, to, to shift their thinking about this. So uh, examples like, if the construction sector is in distress, can you switch some of the people who are working, you know, normally in construction, can you switch them to retrofitting homes? Uh, because that would be good for, for energy efficiency, good for people's bills, good for climate change, um, uh, and it would help to support a sector that was struggling. So this time around, uh, we've had some slightly better headlines. Um, we saw the Prime Minister last week talk about 10 point plan uh, for a green industrial revolution. And this covered um, a number of big areas. It kind of pulled together ideas from across the economy. And it's one of the first times that a UK prime minister has personally put their name um, and their brand to an idea that not just one specific bit of climate action, but um, whether it's transport, homes, um, industry, uh, just that the whole gamut of, of economic life, um, if we decarbonise it, it will be a boost for the economy. So, um, let me see, can I shift on? Yep, so here are some of the things that came out in the 10 point plan, um, and this got supported yesterday in the spending review, which confirmed money for these things. Um, so in offshore wind, uh, the government promised to uh, power, to provide power for every home uh, by 2030 from offshore wind. Uh, on hydrogen, there was a huge um, promise on scaling up low carbon hydrogen production within a decade. Uh, on electric vehicles, uh, the government said that it wouldn't be possible to buy new diesel or petrol cars by 2030, uh, and there'd be a lot of money put into charging infrastructure. Um, homes and buildings, as I said, uh, a, lo a lot of investment in home insulation and heat pumps uh, and so forth. So, um, so that's a a real statement by the government um, about its intentions. Now, obviously, uh, this is not enough to achieve net zero, and um, there have been some fair criticisms about, you know, does the government think this is going to get us all the way to 2050? No. Uh, but it is an important signal because despite everything that is going on in the economy, you now have a government which says it's committed to climate goals, uh, it is increasing spending at a difficult time, a very difficult time, um, and that it expects and, and, um, and requires the private sector, local councils, households, consumers and others to, to respond to that call um, and to see benefits if they do. And if you compare that with what we saw uh, from the uh, Cameron Osborne kind of green crap uh, attitude of a decade ago, I think we've come quite a long way. So what do we hear from businesses? Well, 
I spend pretty much every day talking to industry, to manufacturers, um, and trying to help them to decarbonize their industrial processes. And it has, it has been a very tough year. Um, every company I've talked to has furloughed some people. Um, a lot of them have made redundancies. Some of the companies I spoke to last year no longer exist. They've closed because of COVID. So there are companies which are seeing a drop in demand. They're seeing supply chain interruptions. Uh, they clearly have less cash to invest uh, and all of that can have an impact on their climate action. And they experienced some quite interesting practical problems, um, perhaps that I hadn't uh, imagined before I spoke to them. So it, if, you, if you have a manufacturing process um, and you want to get an engineer to come and talk to you about how can you make it more energy efficient or to decarbonize it, um, for many of the lockdown weeks, it's been impossible to get those other business visitors onto your site, um, especially if they come from abroad and they have to go through a two week quarantine before they can come and see you. Um, that obviously makes it harder for people to provide technical advice. And some companies have to make really difficult decisions. So uh, if you're thinking, do I shut down my steel furnace or do I put my research and development team on furlough? If you can only afford one set of staff because your, your income is lower, um, usually you have to keep your manufacturing process going. So you keep your steel furnace burning um, because it costs so much to close it down and then restart it. Um, and you put your R&D team on furlough. Um, and that has happened for some companies. And again, that means when we go to talk to them and say, well, what ideas do you have? They say, well, you know, we've got some great engineers, but unfortunately they're not able to work at the moment because we can't afford it. And inevitably um, in that context, some of the sustainability announcements that we had expected to see and that companies had wanted to make uh, have been postponed. But uh, I said I'd try and be positive. So uh, what can I say that has been good this year? I think um, as a department, we've still seen a lot of interest from companies in the, the grant support that we're giving. Um, my job is looking after 300 million pounds worth of grant funding for industry. And at the start of this year, I really wondered, um, will they be able to apply to the fund? Um, they have to put in their time, their effort. Uh, they also have to say that they will contribute some matched funding themselves. And I talked really seriously with my team about should we postpone the, uh, the competition? Should we extend it by a few months? Um, perhaps we shouldn't offer so much money. And actually, by the time we got to September, companies had stabilised enough that they could apply um, and we were oversubscribed and we had to increase the budget that we were giving um, to, uh, to that competition. So, so that was a positive story for us, obviously uh, having set up a fund, um, but it also told me that companies are really interested in things like energy efficiency, um, anything that saves them cost at the moment um, is still very much on their agenda. And then more, more generally, uh, you've had some big business associations um, who have published reports and have held conferences and training events uh, on net zero. So um, the CBI, Make UK, uh, British Chamber of Commerce, um, and some of the indiv individual associations like Food and Drink Federation, um, Confederation of Paper Industries, um, a lot of them have published on net zero. And I really respect that this year, which is such a difficult year. They've got so much to contend with, and yet they're still putting that uh, at the centre of their work. And then we're also seeing investment shifting. So uh, investors are moving towards clean energy, they're moving towards clean technologies, and you can see that in the share prices um, of, of companies that are either dirty and losing investment uh, or cleaner and gaining it. Um, and initiatives like yours at KCL, your responsible investment initiative, uh, are helping to make that happen. So therefore, uh, I am optimistic, cautiously so. Um, I'm optimistic for 2021 when we turn the corner from this crisis. Um, and obviously the UK is hosting COP26 uh, and we're going to certainly make a sustainable and resilient economic recovery a big theme of that. And I think um, that Patrick and Thomas will be talking more about it, but uh, of course it's not just the UK who's in this space. Uh, we've just seen a US president and vice president elected uh, who have put building back better at the heart of their agenda and, and creating green jobs. Uh, you have countries like Germany that have 
put in billions of euros into hydrogen and uh, electric vehicles as part of their stimulus. Uh, you've got China who have said they will peak their emissions in the next decade and, and that will be a big focus for their spending as well. So all of these things are steps in the right direction. And of course we've got to do more. Um, it's never enough. Uh, there's going to be a lot of hard work ahead, um, but I think that COVID has created some opportunities. Um, there's going to be a big rebuilding socially and economically. And I think, um, perhaps I'll finish by saying that I think that networks like yours can help to make that difference because you're promoting research, creating people, you're shifting a lot of investment uh, and you are holding decision makers to account. So um, to Andrew and colleagues, I wish you the best of luck as you do it. And I hope that we can work together. Thank you. Thanks for that. That was a really insightful um, sort of uh, talk about the, yeah, get what the government's been doing during and uh, currently to um, deal with COVID. Um, so moving on, we'll have uh, hear from Thomas next, I think. And just for anybody who's just joined recently, uh, whilst Catherine was speaking, um, if you have any questions, uh, put them in the chat at the bottom um, and we'll be able to ask them uh, once all three have spoken. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So yeah, I'm gonna, as I mentioned, sort of talk about some of the, the findings we've had from projects I'm working on about you know, climate denial, EU climate and energy uh, sort of policy making and, and governance, and then about populism. I'm also doing a project on air pollution now as well. So none of them are sort of directly related to COVID. They all started prior to it. However, you know, it's going to reach and, and kind of cover and, and intervene in all of those and all of those findings. So I'll, I'll try and make some links. I mean, one of these sort of more direct um, things, and, and Catherine started off sort of mentioning that sort of more direct uh, sort of personal side of hers. I think one of the big things is all academic conferences, um, you know, we tend to go to quite a few every year. Um, all of them went online this year and next year we're, we're not really sure. But what we then realised as we're teaching to an extent is it's maybe not as good, but you can do it. And, and I think, uh, you know, this really raises a question that was already coming onto the agenda in the last couple of years about, you know, sort of flying shame and about kind of questions about whether we should do this. You know, often we get 10, 15 minutes um, at these events and, you know, some people fly to the US or Australia to do this. So I think there's questions about our ways of working and what we can do. And I think this, this might kind of uh, sort of cause a shift. Um, uh, yeah, and the other thing I suppose to, to come back to the end of, of Catherine's is every year in my uh, I do an, an international politics of energy module and at the end I do a, a sort of lecture I touch upon things that, that I think Patrick's going to touch upon about investment etc and I give some of the, the positives and some of the negatives. I'm never really sure if I'm optimistic or pessimistic going into that or, or at the end and the same is true here. Um, so, so let's see how optimistic I feel at the end of the lecture. I think there are, there are some um, optimistic sort of or areas where we can be optimistic about it but so, so one of the things we've been looking at is is sort of climate de denial and skepticism and we, we've been focusing there on Poland so we, we've chosen Poland because it's a country in which the coal industry is a, is a major um, sort of sector for employment most of the electricity comes from coal it's a big part of um, the economy and, and also part of sort of culture and society I'll, I'll touch upon in it uh, that a bit more so we were trying to explore there uh, to the extent to which over time uh, and this is a country that's hosted uh, sort of multiple climate change conferences as well but over time have we seen a shift in in, in how the government kind of deals with this uh, and the understanding that the kind of government actors have and i think there's been a bit of a shift i mean we don't see much outright denial and i, I think this is a kind of a worldwide trend but it's, it's rare to hear a sort of outright denial now uh, that, that climate change isn't happening it's also quite rare to hear a, a, an outright denial of responsibility um that okay it, it's happening but it's nothing to do with humans uh or humankind there's also not much and this is i think more recent in, in poland and other countries there's, there's a, an erosion of, of sort of denying that a response is necessary i think there is this acceptance there's a kind of consensus that is built and this is all very positive um i mean one of the perhaps more i guess concerning things is what form that acceptance takes and i think there are, there are some 
uh, sort of hints maybe in Poland and then some other countries that whilst there is an acceptance that something should be done the acceptance is one that's kind of caged in okay well let's um, let's base it all on a future technology that's going to come good for us soon or, or technology that exists but it's only in a sort of trial phase you know instead of making the substantial changes that are necessary why not you know pin our hopes on clean coal um, but you know and, and uh, carbon capture and storage is going to be part of the overall sort of uh, you know, pathway to net zero but um, I think there are some concerns there about the, there's a you know kicking the can down the road and saying okay well let's not make these kind of shifts now we can do it soon um, but we're really going to try and prioritize as little change um, as possible and I think that that can be concerning that, that it's maybe just an, kind of an excuse to move things into into the sort of future um, but yeah I think part of that is is just the 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 sheer change that is going to be needed in, in certain societies and economies. Um, this is going to be a sort of fundamental kind of shift, not as big a shift as it would used to be, um, but you know that the number of, of jobs sort of directly and indirectly and that they're often concentrated in certain areas, sort of coal areas in in Poland, makes this a real kind of challenge. It also makes it a challenge for the, for the political parties and the government who are going to do it, that there's a concentration of jobs in these areas, which means that, that, that it's quite hard to bring those people with you electorally um and and so then what we see and this is both positive and negative i think also you know thinking about uh, this kind of future sort of denial maybe that the positive is these debates have really come to the to the forefront in in europe and in the EU and beyond about the idea of a just transition. So there's a recognition that what would be a negative to do would be perhaps something along this sometimes raised what the UK did in the sort of 70s, 80s, dramatically closing down sort of coal mines without a replacement, without an acknowledgement that you really need concerted effort to retrain and reskill and, and, and create new, new jobs. So I think there's a real kind of positive discussion about the necessity of an energy transition to incorporate this and the, the financing that's going to come behind that. I, I think there's the, also the potential that that can be sort of hijacked as an excuse maybe to not do things or to do things too slowly um, or perhaps you know to not lead to, to, for, for, for politicians maybe to not lead the public um, and show you know demonstrate how this can be done in, in a kind of positive way now for Poland this is this, this kind of positive and negative news coming out I mean this is a country that, that that's kind of held back and, and undermined I suppose to an extent some of the EU's kind of progressive uh, climate action um, it, it vetoed the, the, the initial kind of plans for a, net, uh, a 2050 net zero goal. It's still holding out a little bit for, for extra funding on certain issues, but it has, and I think this is a, it's both, it's not enough and it's still quite a, a significant shift. In the last month or so, it's signed, the government signed a deal with the sort of coal unions, et cetera, to have a coal phase out by 2049. Now, is that fast enough? Is that ambitious enough? I, I don't think so. I'm skeptical, but it's a really significant shift to say, okay, we need to recognize that, that, that this doesn't have have an endless future and I think that's a shift because until very recently Polish politicians and not exclusively Polish politicians were saying no this is we're going to do everything we can to kind of save this it's an important part of of the country but we see this in the US as well and um, sort of Trump's claim to kind of be protecting these jobs in the sort of Rust Belt, uh, etc. So so I think that there's some kind of positive um, shift there but it's you know, some of the big challenge I think that sort of exists is a legacy of the previous power that, that some of these fossil fuel industries had in the coal industry in Poland, that they have privileged access to politicians. Um, they, they, they're organized lobby groups. They're able to mobilize as well and kind of strike to kind of change government policy. Um, there is, you know, there hasn't been that much of a kind of progressive uh, sort of force within the political parties. Um, there hasn't been much to kind of ratchet up um, ambition on, on that side. Um, but we see some kind of shifts that maybe some of those lobby groups are starting to kind of weaken that this is an issue that's now coming into um, elections i think there's maybe maybe starting to get kind of an acceptance that uh, you know this energy transition is happening you can't really hold it back it's about accepting uh, sort of managing and maybe later accelerating the, the, that sort of decline um, and this links a little bit with what we've been looking at, at sort of populism and, and energy transition. So before COVID, populism was the thing to research. And, and now I guess it's populism and COVID. Um, but we're looking just across Europe, what's what's happening here? Are, are right-wing populist parties and left-wing populist parties and sort of centrist populist parties, what are they doing? Are they 
genuinely kind of holding things back and um, are they really unambitious because this is what the the literature would expect that these are generally parties and you know to an extent including those who support them uh, who are really skeptical about having any international coordinated response skeptical about international institutions sometimes skeptical about science and you know and contesting science contesting the elites um, the, the kind of cosmopolitan elites who are sort of driving this this forward and um, that don't see that, that that some of this would be you know wins for them that this is something that they're sort of going to fight um, and we've seen and I uh, let's see what what effect COVID has but we've seen the rise of populist parties across Europe and um, you know increasingly sort of prominent in not only in government sometimes or in coalition and opposition but also in the European Parliament so it's so our finding is in some ways kind of this yeah it kind of confirms some of this pessimism um, that being in power might mean that they moderate um, you know if an opposition populist party moves into to, to big coming government it might moderate slightly their policy but they're generally still quite sort of negative um on this then they're not progressive at all um and, and on rhetoric you know the, the the sort of anti sort of energy transition rhetoric is still still to the fore but on the positive side there are other populist parties there are left-wing populist parties and centrist populist parties there's a five-star movement in italy and podemos in spain that have actually been really ambitious there's a, there's a form of populism that's actually really quite quite positive for, for sort of climate policy and also the right-wing populist parties they generally haven't been that effective uh, they haven't been able to kind of build coalitions they haven't been able to successfully sort of challenge uh, sort of some of the science they haven't really you know they have tried to and at certain points got concessions in terms of eu policy making and eu ambition but they haven't really hijacked or undermined this this uh, sort of completely um, and i think maybe one of the really positive things if we're thinking about the kind of future of energy transitions is there is much less in europe much less contestation of the science much less sort of post-factual um debates about this we can still find this like you know, prominent things about you know these windmills and the effect that these windmills have on on you know various things um on our health and on birds and whatever but but generally there isn't too much of that and i think that's a positive and i think the link there with covid is i think that this is a, this is really potentially dangerous um how, how politicized it can be i also think of the, of the us where climate science and and covid science uh, is far more politicized so i think that's a kind of positive that, that the, the right-wing populist parties and the populist parties we've seen in europe are mixed in terms of whether they support this and they're not undermining the whole kind of project uh, and you know generally they they ebb and flow and and sometimes they, they kind of get kicked out of power um so i think that that's you know one of the, the sort of more uh, um, uh, positive things uh and then i think that there's a kind of question i wanted to link a little bit to to sort of public opinion but then leading into how the eu is dealing with this so what we've seen is this uh you know reasonably it feels quite sustained at the moment over the last sort of two two three years increase in public concern and in the past we've normally seen there's been a really significant difference between for example western europe and central and eastern europe there is still that difference in terms of concern with this but i think it's starting to narrow um and one of the i think important things about this is one of the excuses for not acting uh, often is is public opinion and what's invoked so often i i find in discussions i end up having or, or uh, sort of the discourse i note it with sort of right-wing populist parties is what about the yellow jackets in france you know what we have to be really cautious about moving too fast because it's going to stimulate this kind of public opposition but I don't see so much evidence of that. I think uh, it, it may come um, and there are sort of localized protests and things. But actually what we've seen in, in recent years is this, yeah, this real kind of mobilization um, and it's real, you know, that it's really risen up the agenda again. I mean, there is a note of caution there. And I think maybe Catherine sort of talked, talked around this a little bit as well, which is we've been here before in terms of this has been an elevated concern before. And, you know, maybe it was disappointing what followed in, in the late 2000s. And, and, the, and the kind of parallel there is around Around whether this green recovery this green growth really stays on the agenda or if it's replaced at any point with austerity doesn't seem to be at this case at this stage but it, but it could be um, so I think yeah that this public opinion is going to be really crucial that it's going to have to be you know 
there's going to have to high level have to have high levels of concern to hold politicians and, and uh, uh, to account that what the really positive thing is there seems to be some link between Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebe Rebellion and you know going back to the sort of Paris Agreement these things are all connected and and signing up to these targets be they net zero by 2050 or phasing out cars initially by you know 2040 and then 2030 I mean 2030 until sort of three four weeks ago was a felt like an impossible target there were many important actors who said well we can never do do this there still are right there's still car manufacturers that say this is this is you know we can't do this it's impossible but i think it's quite important that, that public opinion is starting to as a first step get those political commitments and then it has to continue to actually hold them to account and get the sort of policy and legislation to sort of fill in okay how exactly are we going to sort of make these steps towards it um but then just you know the sort of final couple of minutes what's the eu doing and, and there's maybe some kind of room for, for optimism um, here and I think yeah Patrick might, might be talking around sort of issues around investment that so far despite the effect of populist parties despite the you know the, the, the COVID disruption to, to economies the EU's ambition still seems to be stepping up um, you know we look at renewable targets energy efficiency targets and the net zero and uh, emissions they're going to agree to something like a move from 40 percent emissions cut to 55 or higher soon um, so all of these things still seem to be on target and, and I think one of the interesting potentially interesting things is the way they're trying to govern this so there's a sort of mechanism within how they're, they're sort of dealing with climate and energy policy the governance regulation where what they're doing and trying to be a bit innovative and cop well but also copy a little bit from the Paris Agreement is say okay well, what we're going to do is we're going to have really regular stock taking and we're going to publish how you're doing and then we're going to tell everyone exactly how you're doing and what you promised and we want to see your draft plans and if your draft plans aren't good enough we're going to tell you where they're not good enough and this is all going to be hopefully publicized NGOs will pick up on it civil society will pick up on it the press might pick up on it so there's a mechanism that's being brought in to say okay we're going to give you a bit more freedom a bit more kind of pathway to, to you know increase your renewables increase your energy efficiency ambition cut your emissions etc but in return, we're really going to try and hold you to account. Now, I don't know if this will work. I don't know. It's kind of connected with that public opinion, whether we can kind of keep this sort of high up on, on the agenda. But, but it's got the potential maybe to keep that pressure up and maybe keep a bit of peer pressure up that you see other countries are able to do this, that these impossible targets that are being discussed then become agreed and then become you know and, and possible and, and implemented. So I think there are, there are some kind of areas um, improvement and then the, maybe the sort of very sort of final thing there is what I think they're trying to do is take account of some of the sort of failed estimates of, of the d reduction in kind of technology costs and things that the, the uh, International Energy Agency has always been really pessimistic if we look at the reality of, um, sort of cost reductions for solar and, and etc so I think what we've got here is an agreement hopefully by the end of 2020 for what the EU is going to aim for for 2030 and hopefully then within this we're going to be revisiting this in four years five years ago five years and pushing that up and enable that this just to be a stepping stone which then to, to sort of link things back together is where you as a, as a community and where us that's the th this is going to be an ongoing kind of battle there's a it's never kind of won I suppose it's never enough and the Paris Agreement was never enough on its own but unfortunately these things keep coming around so so I think this pressure has to, to sort of uh, continue and continue to, to sort of be ratcheted up so I don't know if I'm optimistic or pessimistic but I see those areas for or optimism on the on the sort of technology side and uh, investment side but also the, the power of agency and to really link it back to King's College that this divestment movement um, I think this has really sort of taken off and, and, and it's maybe replaced a little bit that argument which was you have to be in the room you have to be an investor to change a company's behavior Behavior. well maybe not maybe actually if you divest divest you can really change things and really shift things and this this started off as small groups of individuals so I think there is you know not not that individuals are the way to solve this you know there's big structural things that have to happen and companies have to come but there is a kind of role for agency that I see that, that sort of runs through this that the individuals and groups have, have really kind of pushed these these changes as possible I'll come back to some of the other stuff later I've, I've used up my time Thanks so much. That's uh, really interesting. Yeah, and, and the I don't know drawing the link between um, how public opinion has the ability to shape uh, government action and um, hold governments accountable, really. Um, and yeah, you uh, both you and Catherine actually covered some questions that I was going to ask at the uh, at the end as well for discussion points um, about yeah. So um, sort of is climate change political, and um, how uh, you know 
how can it be changed by uh, say a change in government or um, uh, yeah uh, activist groups and stuff like that um, so yeah uh, if, uh, Patrick is next up uh, more like an international level of uh, green recovery yes <clears throat> Um, hello again. Um, yes, uh, maybe I want to start maybe um, actually realizing many of you studying international relations or international politics. It's also my background. I studied international relations about 15 years ago or so. And back then, climate or sustainability was hardly in the cu cu uh, curriculum back then. Um, so it's great to see that also the, um, the academic teaching and the discipline has changed. And we see, we see that also at Chatham House. Um, Chatham House being uh, a tra traditionally a foreign policy think tank, still is, um, but um, our program, the Energy, Environment and Resource Program, we are now by far the largest program in, in the Institute, which, which is an indication that global sustainability, climate, are becoming much more important for geopolitics. Um, uh, actually, we, we also, our program, we're going to change our name. We've already decided on this week. It's, it's going to be about environment and society um, to reflect much more the, the link between environmental sustainability and social sustainability. Um, that will also then uh, define the way we conduct the research or and the way we look at uh, sustainability transitions. Um, Thomas, you mentioned the just transition. This is definitely also relevant for our research uh, going forward. Um, I've prepared some slides. Um, I'll just share my screen. I think that should work. Um, can you see the slides? Yeah. If you have any uh, questions, actually, uh, and please feel free to interrupt and ask. Um, roughly, some of these three questions, uh, um, I don't necessarily have answers for all of this, but this is what I was trying to look at. First of all, whether COVID-19 and the pandemic has been is an opportunity to accelerate the green transformation and decarbonisation. Um, then, question about what's the role of the international community um, to safeguard lives and livelihoods of, of people in the developing world who are at the forefront of climate change. And um, then I want to briefly mention the circular economy um, as it's my field of research and it uh, connects many of these um, issues. Um, so at the, this is uh, at the start of the pandemic and when lockdowns um, were put in place, uh, there was already a clear message from the UN um, what would, should need to happen in the, um, uh, with the recovery. So it was a very clear message that it should be um, a shift from a gray to a green economy, must deliver green jobs. Um, There's a message about cutting fossil fuel subsidies and um, reform, further reform of the financial system. So that was the message at the start. And um, there are a few websites um, and people looking at actually what's happening with the recovery funding. Um, this is an, um, a tracker by DevEx. Uh, you see the, um, the link down there. It's a very good website about international development issues. And you can see um, they've looked at um, the different areas on which the uh, recovery funds are being spent and about uh, 6.4 trillion are being spent on, sorry, 6.4 uh, 6 uh, billion. Um, uh, being spent on, on environment. Um, no, actually, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. And, and then you can see uh, the different um, funders who are putting money into this um, and here the different regions in which this funding is um, distributed. There's also the share between 
multi-regional initiatives and, and country-specific initiatives. Um, so I, I just recommend this as, as an interesting um, resource to look at, maybe also helpful for your research, um, also to track what's, what's happening with, with the recovery funds. There's also um, uh, this uh, green, stim green Stimulus Index, uh, which is um, calculated by uh, Vivid Economics. There's also the link here. And they've started looking at the greenness of um, the different stimulus packages. They started earlier this year and they've updated this every month. And um, actually there, ha there has been a good trend. So this is the latest update from October, the latest analysis. And the recovery funds have become increasingly greener. So that's, that's the good news. And uh, Thomas, you already mentioned the EU. Um, uh, basically, so that you can see here uh, on, on, on the right side, those funds which are um, relatively green. The UK is also doing quite well in this, in this respect. Um, however, and bad news is also there. Um, large economies and large emitters have hardly put any funds into, into a green recovery. Um, with the US, we might now see a shift there with um, the um, incoming presidency, uh, with uh, Joe Biden, who's already in the campaign um, announced a very detailed climate and environmental plan. So there could be a shift here. Um, so that's also something to, to continue to observe. Um, so at the same time, um, uh, there, have, there has been uh, an assessment. So in parallel to actually climate in Paris, um, the other big agenda that, that we follow is the um, 2030 agenda, the SDGs. There's been an assessment by the UN and the pandemic has been bad news really for the SDGs um, in terms of poverty and um, uh, economic inequality, uh, but also hunger, food insecurity. So a lot of these issues have been um, exacerbated uh, through the pandemic. And uh, this is, um, uh, we tried to highlight this, um, this article that um, I wrote together with uh, Tassine Jeffrey, um, uh, who's the uh, director of the Climate Justice Center at the uh, University of Glasgow. Um, um, and one of the issues that we see is now that we have uh, a number of compounding risks, things coming together. Um, so we have COVID, uh, we have climate, um, poverty, food insecurity, and um, all of these factors are increasing um, geopolitical risks. Um, so these are uh, really worrying trends um, uh, that could um, significantly destabilize um, the international system. So in, in this context, um, the recent announcement that uh, the UK's foreign aid budget um, was cut, um, or is going to be cut down to 0.5% of GDP, that's actually um, quite bad news. So the good news has been on the 10-year environment plan, but um, from the global development or international cooperation perspective, um, this is uh, quite disappointing. Um, you see there's a question. Ah, oh, sorry, no, it's just a link here. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, so the next um, slide here, because we, we did mention the EU and um, so you might have heard about the EU's Green Deal, which actually was already announced end of last year and by the, by the incoming commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen and her team. Um, so they came forward with this, they called it Europe's Man on the Moon program. Um, so it's a very comprehensive approach towards transforming um, economy and, and society. Um, so there's a whole range of smaller policy initiatives within this Green Deal. And initially it was not clear whether they would pull through with it during the pandemic, whether um, 
as Thomas also mentioned, whether there would be resistance to it or not. Um, however, uh, I, I came across these, um, yeah, so um, it covers a whole range of things. I suggest um, uh, it's, it's quite a big package. Um, if you're interested, there's lots of information on it um, to, to understand more. Um, so with this figure, um, they analyzed, um, I think about 40,000 tweets um, that were uh, done before the pandemic on the Green Deal. And I think the data um, are here, uh, before and after, and um, pre-COVID-19, post-COVID-19. And actually, it seems that the support for the Green Deal actually increased. Um, so maybe counterintuitive, um, but people seem to realize that there's a, now an opportunity to, to, to make this shift and that people might probably also think, you now this transition um, is about many things, including uh, not only recovery, but maybe also wider concerns about well-being and um, society. Um, so, just want to mention uh, the circular economy also in the in the context of, of climate change. Um, so, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Michael Browngard. I um, is uh, one of the founders or one of the conceptual thinkers regarding uh, cradle to cradle concepts. Um, cradle to cradle is often used um, as one of the conceptual foundations for the circular economy. Um, and it's, um, you're, you're familiar with the plastics pollution problem. Um, and that's often, that's often the entry point into the circular economy. Uh, the circular economy is not only about um, waste management of plastics, but it's, it's cross-cutting for, for many industry sectors including um, agriculture, construction sectors, um, electronics, um, textiles, uh, automotive, etc. Um, and so Michael Braungart is he saying is climate change is not an energy problem, it's a material mismanagement problem. Um, so looking at this, uh, looking at climate change from this perspective um, can help to come up with some, some equals and more elegant solutions to do with climate. Um, so it's um, a com comprehensive approach that looks across many sectors and um, not only at energy and carbon, uh, but also the, the various materials. Um, this is a figure that we often use um, in our chat and publications. Um, you can find out um, if you look at them. Uh, yeah, you can see it's it's a value chain approach from material supply chains all the way to the um, end of life. And then there's a number of different practices, what we say, uh, circular economic practices, either to, to create loops, loop materials back into the production cycles, but also about slowing flows and narrowing flows of resources through, through the system. Um, there are also uh, a number of reports to show directly how the circular economy can contribute to cutting emissions. Um, maybe too much information to go into detail, but if, if I think it's an important resource that you might be able to use for your resource, uh, research as well. Um, so this is also for some harder to debate sectors. Um, there are a number of solutions that can be used and finally, um, I want to advertise maybe um, some of the research, some of the work that we're doing at Chatham House. Um, just uh, a few weeks ago, we launched this um, microsite. Um, it's called circulareconomy.earth. Um, and what we have there is, um, you can see it's still a work in progress. It's a circular economy policy tracker where we so far, I have only covered Latin America and Africa, um, but we're working on uh, covering every country to give an up-to-date um, uh, overview 
um, of what types of circular economy related policies countries are implementing. And these include either action plans, um, certain types of product standards, um, recycling targets, uh, extended producer responsibility programs, um, or fiscal policies that incentivize shifts um, towards green um, materials. Um, just this morning, um, we actually launched our work on South Asia, um, where we had stakeholders from India, Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, Pakistan, um, Sri Lanka, etc., to share um, um, what's happening um, in the Indian subcontinent. And, and there's a lot happening. Um, Myanmar is working on the Circular Economy Action Plan, and um, it's also becoming a major a focus of UN organizations. So UNDP is involved, um, UNIDO, uh, UNEP, um, and uh, the European Union as well, is including circular economy increasingly into um, their external aid cooperation project. Um, together with this, there's, a, if you're interested in trade, um, also relevant in the context of the pandemic because international trade and global value chains have been disrupted. So we have this um, uh, circular economy trade explorer where we identified a number of um, uh, what we call circular economy uh, commodities uh, from the UN Comtrade uh, database. And with this visualization tool, you can look at different countries, different times, who's trading what, with uh, where, and um, that's also a great tool for, for analysis of international trade flows. Um, some one issue here. This is only the official statistics. Unfortunately, there's a lot of illegal trade happening in waste uh, globally, which is often not captured. Um, so that's one of the things that we won't see. Um, but there's also action happening on on international to to address these issues in the Basel um, Convention. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, I'll just stop here. Uh, you can email me if you're interested. I'm happy to share more information. And um, yeah, thanks for listening. Happy to answer questions. Great, thank you. Yeah, there's um, a lot of interesting information there. Um, yeah, particularly, I don't know how um, how the energy transition is linked to a lot of other uh, injustices around the world um, and how uh yeah transition to a circular economy would also sort of uh, be impacted by the other uh sort of sdgs and um goals development goals around the world um so we've got a couple of questions um uh that have come in um <clears throat> uh, so. So uh, one of the questions was, um, with the UK's formal transition period from the EU ending at the end of December, uh, how will this affect the UK's international environmental policy and what actions should be taken to address the energy transition in developing countries? Um, so I guess that applies to um, all of the speakers, if anybody has anything to say. Mm -hmm. Um, Andrew, I'm happy to um, share a few thoughts on that, uh, on the uh, UK's departure from the EU and what that means. I mean, I guess I'd say that uh, obviously as COP26 presidents next year, um, jointly with Italy, uh, there's a lot of work going on with the EU partners, um, but just also it's kind of a massive international diplomatic effort. Um, and I see that uh, very practically in, in terms of how many of my colleagues uh, from the, the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office have been appointed to be climate change ambassadors in different regions of the world. Um, so there's, I don't think there's any retreat um, in terms of the UK's kind of diplomatic presence on climate change. I think it's, it's being hugely invested in. Um, obviously, we're no longer at the table when EU decisions are, are getting made um, and when standards are being set or investment decisions taken. Um, but there's still a lot of discussion that happens between, uh, between the UK government and uh, and its neighbours um, and I think you know at the moment we're in a negotiation stage and that's got a certain dynamic attached to it 
Uh, but if you look, say, at how Norway or Switzerland work on, on climate change, they take it really seriously. They talk to the EU a lot. Um, they share good ideas and best practices and they learn from one another. So I think that's, I think that's where we're going to get to uh, soon if we're not there already. Uh, yeah, well, maybe I just mentioned a, a few things. I think um, it's going to be very interesting. I think, as as Catherine mentioned, the UK has been an incredibly positive uh, actor when it comes to the EU's sort of climate ambition. Uh, so one of the challenges is for the EU to maintain that and then prove it can maintain that whilst losing one of its more ambitious uh, members. And then obviously for the UK to kind of main, maintain that 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 as well. I mean, I, I guess it's not inevitable that it's going to be used to its full um, kind of potential. And, and yeah, maybe just to go back to the to the Polish uh, hosting in Katowice. Now, there were some kind of positives that came out of that, certainly. But this was a, you know, there was an exhibition where you could, which was about coal, because this was the coal, uh, it was in the coal heartland. Um, but, you know, this was wh where the EU, where Poland was able to kind of push some things that might not all be seen as so progressive. So I think it's an interesting one, but also because of the sort of shifting geopolitics here, which is to what extent does this government Will the UK government really prioritise sort of environmental issues and climate issues and fill in and, and follow up yesterday's yesterday's announcement um, with further announcements to really say, OK, this is our plan. This is our plan to get to net zero because at the moment there isn't enough there, uh, but one wouldn't necessarily expect enough uh, in terms of policy. So that's but But then we've got that shifting dynamics of, yeah, what's happened in the US and, and we still don't know for sure exactly how ambitious uh, sort of Biden is going to be. And, you know, those on the left of the Democratic Party are saying, hang on, you need to be doing more, but, but very, very much to to sort of judge that and then and then we've got that interesting dynamic i think of normally or in previous sort of uh, climate change conferences we've seen the interactions between the eu the Ch uh, china and the us periodically the us not being really involved and now the us but the fact that the uk is going to be independent of that um yeah i think it's gonna be really fascinating i don't know it's gonna be, it's gonna be fascinating to see what kind of coalitions are built and um it's an opportunity i think but it's uncertain i think there's, we're going to see a lot about whether the the uk really uses this as an opportunity um, to kind of host it as part of kind of global Britain, independent Brexit Britain. Um, I don't think it's a, it's a given, but I think it's a real opportunity. Um, yeah, so there was a second part to that question about the developing country, but I'll let Pat Patrick go next. So what was that second part again? Yeah, so um, the second part was uh, what action should be taken to address the energy transition in developing countries um, by the year? Right, yes. Um, yeah, it links to the point that I made before, actually. Um, uh, I mean, DFID has done significant work in the past to also promote um, clean energy uh, in, in, um, in developing countries through the development corporation. Um, I hope this will not be jeopardized now when the budget is cut. Um, um, so which types of programs uh, will be continued, which ones might stop? Um, I haven't seen any information about this uh, yet. Maybe it's too early, but um, uh, I think these are important uh, and to be continued. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Um, next question we've got is um, for anybody who wants to answer. Um, there are procurement policies in place. Are there procurement policies in place to change the food industry and policy in place to support healthy plant based consumption? Because if meat production and consumption produces about 20% of carbon emissions, would it be useful to establish policies that tax food producers based on their carbon output in food production? It's quite a long one. <laughs> Uh, so I have to admit, uh, despite being here uh, on behalf of the government, I don't know very much about agricultural climate policy. Um, I think one of the things that the, the replacement for the cap is uh, common agricultural policy in the UK, um, our new regime of, uh, of supporting farming um, is trying to move more towards uh, environmental and sustainability goals, uh, but others may know more of the details than that. Um, so, as I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm vegetarian, going trying to go vegan, uh, and 
you know, generally I agree with uh, the question of, you know, if we were all a bit more plant based, wouldn't that be really good for the planet? Um, I think it's that's a pretty difficult political sell. Um, I remember Nick Stern, um, you know, the great economist on climate change, uh, saying something very, very um, mild uh, in, in response to a question like that a few years ago. And it was headline news everywhere. You know, Nick Stern wants to ban ham sandwiches. And it was just uh, and I, I spoke to him afterwards and he said, it, I did not say that. Uh, I just said, you know, a bit more plant, a bit less meat, uh, you know, could add up to a helpful contribution. Um, but I think with with the net zero target and with the carbon budgets that get set as well eventually agriculture is going to have to um to decarbonize you know whether we're all going to be veggie or just a bit more veggie uh you know that is we're probably heading in that direction um in a in a previous job this is a, a small thing um I, I used to work in brazil on behalf of the uk government um and one of the things we tried to export to brazil um, was uh, from the UK, some ingenious innovator uh, had come up with some pellet that if you fed it to cows, uh, basically they burped and farted less and they emitted less methane. Uh, and you can imagine that Brazil produces quite a lot of cows uh, and, uh, and they're all producing quite a lot of methane. So there are some technical solutions um, that don't mean that, uh, that people who love steaks have to give them up. Uh, you can still decarbonize uh, while, while enjoying that to some extent. Yeah, I, I don't know too much about kind of agriculture and, and procurement in this field. I mean, there is the sort of, it's a slight thing, but, you know, about a month ago, the European Parliament rejected the ban on the use of sort of veggie sausage, veggie burger, this kind of stuff. Um, so maybe that's, that's significant. It, and I don't have the, the statistics here, but it does seem, you know, the FT is quite frequently talking about the big uh, sort of beyond, beyond burgers and the, the different kind of companies that are invested in this and how much in sort of seed funding they're getting and uh, et cetera. But this is, it does strike me as something that, that's very kind of slow, very, very slow, and then very sudden. Um, like this, the, the kind of change in diets and flexitarianism. And, you know, to, to an extent, that's me talking from my sort of North London bubble or whatever, uh, this isn't happening everywhere at all. But I think there has been a kind of shift there, and, and for various reasons. Right? I think it it, it it nicely there's kind of co benefits that you can see. You might choose it for environmental reasons. You might choose it uh, for kind of health reasons. Or you might choose it for you know, taste reasons, or whatever. But but there's the sort of various things that are sort of driving that. And and yeah, from not from nowhere. Obviously, it's been long in the sort of pipeline. But that does seem to be a really kind of dramatic shift that, that's happening. Um, and yeah. I, I think that's a kind of a positive, but, you know, from a very low base, uh, you know, vegetarianism and veganism is still a very sort of minority pursuit, but, but I don't know, I'd be interested to see what this generation, um, you know, the percentage, you know, at the, the King's sort of canteen, right? There's, there's lots of discussions around this and one of the cafes has gone vegan and, you know, so little shifts here, um, that there's some room for optimism perhaps. Mm -hmm. There's, sorry, if I can just jump in, there's definitely potential for Kings to go further as well. So there's a lot of talk been in the last couple of months with the Kings Climate Action Network about the the Kings cafes being able to report the carbon footprint of each meal that you eat. Um, and so we're hoping that within the next kind of six months, six to six to twelve months, we're going to be able to do that at Kings to have a carbon footprint for each menu item. Um, and so that'd be a really positive step, I think. And it'd be interesting to see the reaction of Kings to that. Yeah, definitely. And I think there's um, definitely a debate to be had around um, to what sort of extent should the government be influencing or pushing this sort of uh, like a change to transition to plant based diets and um, everything like that. And um, yeah. Just, just, just to add on this, I think maybe the pandemic is again also um, an opportunity because it's raised awareness about genetic diseases like virus jumping from animals to, to humans. And so coronavirus is not the first one. There are other pandemics, avian bird flu, swine flu, um, a, a whole range of them, um, which are also linked to factory animal farming. Um, so I think people are getting more aware about the issues and the unsustainability of the whole, um, um, yeah. I don't know, meat, meat system that we involved in. So that, that could also be um, maybe leveraged at the stage to make sh changes here. 
Yeah, I know um, recently there were some headlines about uh, mink farms across Europe and uh, I don't know if it was other places, but yeah, factory farmed minks um, catching a new strain of COVID and spreading it rapidly and that leading to um, uh, culling of massive amounts of um, the animals. So yeah, I think there's a, 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 it's an important uh, point that uh, link between sort of environmental degradation by uh, mass farming of animals and also uh, more directly human like health issues related to that in the spread of diseases and um, yeah health implications as well. Uh, so moving on, we've got another question um, that asks uh, Catherine specifically um how but anybody can answer if they have anything to say how does the green think tanks lobby interact with and influence uh bis and how about uh external thing uh external uh groups like uh, extinction rebellion or student protests yeah. Um, I'm now feeling really nostalgic uh, for working in the office and having protests outside. I've missed that this year. Um, we had a lot of protests, as you can imagine, because we're the Department for Energy and, uh, and responsible for kind of, the, the, we're the centre of climate change policy in the UK government. Uh, so we quite often have people gluing themselves to our front entrance. Um, uh, and um, I guess on a personal level, it's um, I find it quite motivating having protesters outside. It's nice to know that people care about climate change. It's nice to know that people look at some of the more borderline decisions um, that the government takes. You know, if it's if it's keeping gas power going, uh, you know, to balance the grid, and people are outside saying we don't like that. Um, but that kind of continual pressure, uh, I think, is. Um, with my climate activist hat on, uh, I, I quite appreciate. Um, I quite like it when I go outside and people from Extinction Rebellion very politely give me leaflets and say, um, make a difference. <laughs> and it's like, I know, I'm wearing a pinstripe suit, but I really do try to make a difference uh, in my job. Um, and when there were the big student strike, um, school strike marches uh, last autumn was it about a year ago now uh, a lot of us went out um, and uh, enjoyed just seeing thousands of people out on the street um, so I think there's you know from an official perspective there's probably quite a positive feeling about it um, but, but in terms of influencing government policy um, I think NGOs and, and activist groups have got a couple of different ways you can either um, go out and influence public opinion and so Big protests help to shape public opinion. Um, you know, social media campaigns, uh, kind of cu cultural campaigns. Those influence how millions of people think, and then that shows up in how they vote, uh, and then that has an effect on policy. Um, and there are some other NGOs who are more issue specific uh, and a bit techier, and they publish um, quite detailed policy reports. And if they time it well, and they talk to us, and they talk to special advisors, um, it's perhaps got less public fanfare but it can also have an impact um, so an example is um, there's a task a task force on climate related financial disclosures that's been quite a big um, pressure group movement for several years now trying to get the government to legislate to say that companies have to um, have to uh, publish their their carbon footprints um, and their their exposure to carbon risk um, and gradually that's worked away, worked away with policy officials. It's perhaps never the front page of the Daily Mail or the Guardian, um, but it is really important because that is turning into regulation, which will then influence companies' behaviour. Um, so, yeah, if, you're, if you are uh, thinking about your future action in this area, both of those routes, uh, I think, um, is, is promising, but you, you, you either kind of go for the main... Um, mainstream of public opinion and have a big splash uh, or you go a bit more niche and a bit more technical. Um, sorry, I think I'll just quickly jump in here. Um, first of all, thank you so much um, to all of you, um, Catherine, Barbara, Patrick, uh, Schroeder and Thomas Malpi. Um, thank you so much for sharing your your knowledge with us and uh, this has been really really insightful 
Um, and especially inspired um, to hear that there are climate activists in, in government and in think tanks and in academia. I think this is, this is really, really great news. Um, lovely to hear. Um, I was just, I was thinking um, of asking a few questions uh, related to what Max um, asked in the chat. So how can we, so now we are a student, groups at, a student group at King's. Um, we try to influence like people at King's and also like beyond by having these events. So how, how do you think, like, do you have any advice or like, recommendations on how we can actually um, have further um, influence or like how we can maybe um, lobby or 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 try to get our sort of word out further and like influence um, maybe policy making or politics and like think tanks um, and engage with with these things um, and also so that was one question. And also, um, Tao, since um, half of the committee is studying international relations, um, a lot of us are interested in going that way. Um, Andrew is studying physics, and uh, some of some others are studying like sciences as well in the committee and in, in our society. Um, do you have any sort of advice on how to continue on this, like with the, with the career? Um, and with our future jobs and um, like how we can sort of keep this going when we when we also graduate and after after we finish sort of being in this bubble of, of activists and people that are like minded. Um, yeah, it's up to you who wants to who wants to start on this. <laughs> Maybe Catherine or Thomas, yeah. <laughs> I think Thomas was going to come oh, in and then I'll follow I, him. No, I mean, I was, I was going to say maybe, maybe just on the, on the first things that you mentioned and then, then I'll let Catherine speak and I might come back. But I mean, I think the university is a really, a really good place to be pushing. And I think because the student body have had, pro, you know, there's been prior successes on, on various issues. Uh, I think this really is an area in which, you know, they're, they're obviously not going to listen to everything. They're not going to change on everything and they may just pretend to listen on certain issues. But I think there are some receptive voices at various levels within the university and maybe all universities. And I think because of the scale of it, because of the amount of money that they spend on things to do with kind of heating and catering and, and things like this, I think that is an opportunity to, to sort of start to shift things. Um, and, you know, it seems like, you know, some of the divestment campaigns can then move beyond or at least influence other sort of broader kind of campaigns. So I think it's to keep pressuring on, on some of the areas where the, where the university's already kind of conceded or uh, is open to kind of change. And I suppose that there are different ways to do this. One is through this, this actual kind of um, organization you have, but, um, but also it is to try and, you know, grow this organization, like get people involved, get people sort of signed up um, and try and put put pressure on your departments that's not quite as uh, you know successful but there are kind of roots and mechanisms there are sympathetic people with not too much time in the academic community perhaps or all communities so like oh, it would be good if uh, someone kind of pushed us to um, you know shift from using bottled water to using tap water or whatever maybe that's already happened but there are certain things quite achievable things that can still be done there's still some quite low-hanging fruit in the institution you're, you're working within so I think really to kind of keep pushing well, you might be able to kind of make some sort of dramatic change there and to try and coordinate where possible with other kind of student groups and, and with academics where possible and try and get yourself into positions of you know minor influence there's like the king's 100 and the, the, we've got the faculty our faculty's got 25 where we're re in, recruiting people to work on education issues but it's an opportunity to kind of get those messages up so i would, I would kind of push wherever you can um yeah, but I'll, I'll come back to, to maybe some of the things but let, let catherine speak Thanks. Um, I, I don't know if I've got advice to, to offer on, on university activism, I guess. For, for a long time, activism, there's quite a, a nicely, nicely approach of um, talking about climate change. At the beginning of when climate change came out as, a, as an issue in, in public discourse, perhaps in the 1990s, people thought about climate change as an environmental issue. Um, and then over the next decade or so, it switched to being more, well, um, let's think about climate change as an economic issue, as a security issue, as a health issue. And I think a lot of activism 
uh, sought to um, to look at the uh, I guess what's called in the jargon the co-benefits. So you know, let's let's um, save energy. We'll be cutting down our carbon emissions, but we'll also be saving costs. And, and I still think there's quite a lot of mileage in that. You know, people like seeing it's it's not just for the not just for the planet. It's also good for people's health and um, standard of living and uh, and economics um, and you know the um, the money they've got in their pocket. Um, but I think what I've observed in the last three or four years has been um, a somewhat more resolute and less compromising attitude to activism, um, school and student activism. Um, and I think that's also powerful. Um, and I think when that's connected to telling politicians, uh, we are your future voters, um, we are your longest group of voters. You know, those those 50 year olds and 60 year olds are going to be around for a while, but we're going to be here longer. And do you want to win our votes or not? And this is our top issue. Um, I also think that that kind of uncompromising approach um, has uh, a serious impact too. So I don't know, those are reflections rather than advice. Um, where it comes to, to getting jobs in this area, um, first of all, I think if you're interested in it, there will be jobs. Uh, you know, everything uh, is going to have a climate change dimension in future. Um, it, that, that's just, uh, that's inevitable. Um, in, in terms of British diplomacy, uh, we hire a lot of people um, to, uh, to represent us around the world on climate change uh, and energy issues. Um, and uh, so the FCDO is well, well worth looking at. Um, and I think COP26 is a really interesting opportunity for activist groups um, to, to organise events. You know, there's going to be so much coverage about climate change next year. Um, if you're recruiting for the, um, the Climate Action Network, do some events around COP and help people get involved. And, you know, if, if you can get to Glasgow, marvellous. Um, who knows quite what movement will be like uh, in a year's time. Hopefully we'll all be out and about and on the streets again. Um, but, but even if it's virtual, um, I do think that, that um, theming things around that uh, will be a good way of recruiting. Yeah, I would just, just to come back very briefly. Yeah, I think I think that's the real kind of window of opportunity, isn't it, of, of kind of interest amongst the student body and beyond next uh, next autumn. And I, hopefully it will coincide because I think activism is tough at the moment, right? M many forms of environmental activism, some of the, the sort of the, the, the main mechanisms by which you try and influence uh, and, and try and set the agenda and get, get public, they're just not really available at the moment. But I think that that will be a kind of a real point, a real kind of opportunity, I suppose, in terms of careers. And, and you know, we, we've got someone from Chatham House here today, which is great. So there are opportunities to kind of get involved with various kind of think tanks and other kind of groups and get work experience working on, on these kind of issues. But, but also, I suppose, now we've got a, I think there's a real kind of wealth of opportunities to choose a more specialist well what at the moment sounds more specialist but i think to, to yeah I mean, to what Catherine was alluding to i think in five years ten years already we've kind of seen a shift that the climate policy and climate change was a part of various other sub subjects i think it's going to be a much more significant part of of any kind of subject you think of in, in the future but there are, there are opportunities to do sort of environmental economics master environmental law environmental politics environmental science so to choose actually specialist sort of master's programs where you can actually yeah you can kind of demonstrate that that education kind of background and maybe even doing the sort of dissertation with it so i think there's those opportunities but i don't know maybe i'll, I'll leave it to, to sort of patrick if he wants to talk a little bit about, uh, about his institution um Yes, I think generally in terms of um, in terms of uh, jobs in, in this type of uh, to do this as a career, I think there will be increasingly opportunities. Um, just what I, I personally have seen um, this kind of field expand quite quite significantly over the last decade. Um, so if you if you stick to it. Um, I'm sure you, you find something, if you're passionate about it, you, you definitely find something. Um, uh, it might not be st uh, straightforward. Um, my, my, my path wasn't fully straightforward. Um, uh, and uh, this might link to what we do at, uh, at Chatham House, for example. Chatham House um, and many other think tanks as well, they um, have uh, internship programs. Um, so you, um, at the moment we're not having any interns because it's all, um, we're not in the offices anymore. It's, um, we're all working from home, but, um, next year this should start again. Um, 
um, feel free to contact me. I can, I can con um, put you in touch with other colleagues who are running the internship program. And um, we've had several uh, people working in this um, field on climate finance, um, um, others have done climate policy related work. So they've come in, stayed with us for a few months, and then went on to do a PhD, for example, or they went on and worked elsewhere. Um, so, yeah, no, we, um, and again, um, we also, this is again a shift, um, we're increasingly also interested in um, engaging with, uh, with uh, students or creating networks um, of, of young leadership um, across the world. So um, it's also an opportunity to connect with people from Africa, from Asia, Latin America, um, because it's in a way, I think it's these global alliances which are important to also shift it um, on the international level. Um, and then, well, yeah, emphasizing also what Catherine and Thomas said, I think COP26 is a huge opportunity. Um, if you can organize events, already not not just at the COP, but you can already start thinking of now. Um, think tanks are planning now what to do. <laughs> so um, it's kind of, uh, we've run, we started actually earlier this year because we thought it was going to take place now. Um, diplomatic briefing series for the diplomatic community in London on, um, on the topic. Um, and we're going to continue this throughout next year. Um, I mean, generally, I think it would be very powerful if UK students, um, not just one university, but um, uh, if you join up with other groups at other universities um, across London, um, across the UK, uh, could organise something for COP, that would be a very strong message also to, um, to decision makers. Yeah, and there may well be opportunities to do, um, you know, I guess you can act within your current kind of group and, and, and yeah, networking with, with other kind of universities that are doing this, but I suppose there's also going to be sort of more formal or informal kind of vol volunteering opportunities within other sort of organized sort of think tanks and NGOs. And one, of the, one of the challenges you've got, I suppose, is that COP's going to, I don't know the exact dates yet, I don't know if they're probably, but, you know, it's going to fall perhaps in term time a little bit, but the, the, there's those challenges, but there may well be, you know, opportunities that are advertised and might be the kind of thing where you can do speculative approaches to, to various organizations, particularly if you're willing to volunteer and say look actually you know i plan on being here for a week um you know this is this is my plan what what could i do or in the run-up so yeah i think it's a there's an opportunity there yeah definitely um we actually was uh during the summer um as a committee sort of um uh playing with the idea of uh like a cop 26 visit um but obviously that's before it was all announced that it would be postponed and um sort of uh yeah the early days of um covid when we didn't know how long it was going to last but yeah uh definitely if um yeah something like that could be arranged next year i think that's uh, a really good opportunity to uh spread uh, awareness and knowledge and uh, engage more more people than uh, otherwise we'll be able to um so yeah we're coming to half seven so i think it's probably uh time to wrap up um thank you so much for uh attending and um uh, speaking for us today um it's been a really interesting really insightful and um uh engaging uh discussion and um i hope some of the people that attended today will um, have learned something and uh, be uh, come away more um, uh, interested in this field. So um, thank you, and um, yeah, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, um, all of you, and thank you for those last uh, replies as well. Um, very encouraging. Um, yeah, so we actually have, uh, we are planning an event on, on COP26 together with the Diplomacy Society. And that's going to be in next, next, next term. And yeah, as Andrew said, we were planning on going to Glasgow, but that, of course, got cancelled or postponed. 
Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your, for, for speaking, for sharing um, your knowledge and, uh, and for your good advice as well. Yes, thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you, everyone who attended. Um, thank you. If someone Thanks, wants guys. to stay.